Not a lot of familiar faces out there. Ready? Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting. Uh, my name is Lee Brenner. I'm a business, de business development lead on the technology and civic engagement team over at Microsoft. I'm a term member of the council as well. Uh, but really excited to be here to uh, talk about emerging technology, the future of space. Uh, we have three great panelists. Uh, Lori Garver, who's the general manager of the Airline Pilots Association. She's also the former deputy administrator of NASA. Uh, John Logsdon, a professor emeritus of political science and international affairs from the, at the Elliott School of International Affairs and a longtime uh, space policy person in Washington, D.C. and is part of... Uh, the United States Space Policy, and Charles Miller, president of NextGen Space, LLC. So I think we're going to start, uh, Charles is actually going to give an overview of what we're really going to talk about to give a, a base for our conversation. And then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to uh, give a little bit of an overview, and we're going to jump into questions, a really, hopefully, in-depth discussion. And then we'll open up the uh, questions to you, so hopefully you'll have uh, many of those questions as well. So Charles. Thanks, Lee. Um, so I've got a few minutes. They asked me to set the context of the conversation for, for uh, the future of space. There's uh, a few general arcs uh, that overlie most uh, key issues in, in space today and some, uh, some, some uh, current situational issues. The, the, uh, one of the first arcs is uh, really the, I call the arc of Apollo. Um, Apollo was this amazing success. Uh, and we've been trying to repeat Apollo since then um, and uh, had many attempts to do so since Apollo, nearly uh, approaching 50 years now. Um, there's been many attempts to repeat it. Was, uh, first was Bush 41 on the 20th anniversary and uh, it didn't work. Uh, it was unaffordable. Again, uh, in, um, well, actually the first one, that was the second one. The first one was right of following Apollo. Uh, Dr. Logson wrote a book on it. Um, um, after Apollo in the Nixon administration, uh, they tried to get an attempt to go to Mars. It was considered to be unaffordable. Uh, then the second one with Bush 41 considered to be unaffordable. And the third attempt was the vision for space exploration in Bush 43's administration. And they wanted it to be affordable. They set the guidance to do it within the existing budget, but NASA stood up a plan called Constellation that was ultimately unaffordable. Uh, uh, Lori here, uh, as Deputy Administrator of NASA, was part of the leadership and this independent review that uh, looked at it again three in a row. It was unaffordable, so they, they canceled Constellation and uh, um, set up some of the situation where we are today. They tried to do a new innovation with commercial and technology to uh, achieve our national goals in space at a much lower price. Um, that was resisted. So one of the key themes today is, is the, the uh, dynamics between uh, the old traditional approach to uh, space with uh, traditional government-centric uh, model, and uh, you call that kind of maybe the status quo. Some say old space, and then there's another dynamic, innovative, commercial approach. Some call it new space that uh, wants to uh, uh, propose new space. Some of the uh, fundamentals of uh, going on is the International Space Station just uh, was justified as a national geopolitical. It was saved. It was on the verge of being canceled, and we brought Russia in. So national geopolitical objectives play a very important role in space, which is uh, why part of the reason we're having uh, this event here. Um, and it saved the space station. It just uh, satisfied its... Uh, had its 15th year anniversary of humans in space at the International Space Station. I think 15 nations are there. Uh, it also was a key part of Apollo. It was the uh, geopolitical justification. It was the real reason, and uh, one of Dr. Logson's books uh, goes into a great detail, that Kennedy created the Apollo program. It was a masterful exercise of soft power. Um, some of the uh, other thrusts going on is uh, we're still today, we have about $3 billion a year. NASA's focused on a Mars program. Uh, they were recently criticized uh, uh, on this Mars program. They still don't have a program and strategy 
Um, they don't have a budget or schedule to show when they're getting to Mars or how much it's going to cost. And meanwhile, commercial space keeps on going along. You have companies like uh, SpaceX with Elon Musk. You have Bert, uh, I mean, uh, Paul Allen investing in it. And you have Jeff Bezos from Amazon.com uh, with a company called Blue Origin and a lot of other companies, including some of your members of the Council of Foreign Relations, like Letitia Garriott is the president of a company called Escape Dynamics. There's a lot of innovation in that area. And that, that kind of sets the stage for where we are today. Um, what I'm doing in this, just a, a short one minute, I uh, recently, Next Gen Space, completed a study for NASA, uh, funded by NASA, of if could we leverage commercial space partnerships to send humans to deep space. And we specifically looked at the moon. And the answer was, and we had a bunch of uh, former retired NASA engineers, is we could return humans to the moon using commercial partnerships by the end of the second term of the next president and do it within NASA's existing budget. And uh, looked at things like an international lunar authority and there's uh, you know, significant geopolitical benefits to that as well, but that's uh, what Next Gen Space is working on. Right, thank you, Charles, very much. Laura, if, give us a little bit of background. Obviously, we know you, you worked at NASA <laughs> And I'll set, I'll set this up um, for your kind of introductory, but is, is NASA doing what it needs to do to support emerging technologies in the, space, in the space space? So my background, political science and economics, led me to uh, really focus on, for space policy, the purpose and the why we are exploring. Of course, as Charles said, we're focused here today on the human spaceflight part of NASA. And NASA, of course, is just the government part of space activities. So there's a number of other things that are driven, I think, more by uh, the purposes that drive large expenditures in other areas. And Neil Tyson gives a great talk about fear, greed, and glory. And to me, being uh, very supportive of uh, a democracy and capitalism, we have the ability with space, I think, to reinforce both. And I did try to focus NASA more on doing that. Investment in technology is a big part of that because we know our government is here really as somewhat of a safety net and to buy down the risk, technical risk, as well as market risks. And I believe a sustainable long-term space exploration strategy does that by lowering the costs uh, to entry, the barriers to entry, and utilizing all the talents of the nation for our benefits, whether those be economic, uh, the greed part, fear, the national security part, or the glory part, which are a lot of social benefits that come out of that investment. So I think we could do better, but NASA is at an $18 billion agency doing a lot of amazing things uh, for the nation and the world. And I think there, frankly, is a lot of political support for that. And John, you've been paying attention to this since really the beginning of the space program. Uh, and been involved is is the based on your observations over that time is the space program where it is today whether it's uh, the government space program or the broader space program set up to be successful uh, for whatever its its goals are uh, or does there need to be a dramatic shift in the way people are thinking about it dramatic no but I think uh as you say, I've been looking at this for 50 plus years. We're closer to being able to send people to Mars today than we ever have been. It doesn't mean we're close, <laughs> but the trajectory is in that direction, is a return to deep space. Uh, I, I think we should stop at the moon on the way out. It's just the offshore island, but uh, we're building systems that can take us there. The only problem, as Laurie suggested, is that the attempt to inject new technology into those systems hasn't worked. So we're building systems based on 70s technology. Space shuttle main engine, in particular, is going to power the big new rocket, solid rocket boots, or it's like were used on the shuttle. So, and we still haven't adjusted our ambitions to the amount of resources the political system and the public seem willing to give to the space program about a half of 1% of the federal budget. So uh, the, the expectations created by early success really cast a, a, a shadow 
uh, over what we are doing, which is not bad at all. Well, so on that point, and, we, and you had talked about the idea of being that there, that there is there are these two space programs. There's the commercial and government. But if the commercial side and what you're working on as well is that there, that's where the innovation is, right? That's where people are putting it. They're they're building new technologies. What is stopping? Uh, and this is for really for for the entire panel. What is stopping the government from? saying, all right, let's, let's take the rocket that was just built last year, opposed to the technology from the 70s, and use that instead. What, what rocket built last year? Well, <laughs> well for as an example, if there commercial were a, a commercial Well, there are, there are. You SpaceX could use, is SpaceX you could use the private commercial. modern system. I mean, it's yeah. the tale of government overall. It, it is a bureaucracy, and NASA came out of uh, the direction, as Charles said, of beating the Russians with Apollo been sort of looking for a purpose ever since, and it becomes self-sustaining, uh, self-sustainment is a purpose. And so you have lots of people, well, I grew up with Apollo, I want to build the biggest rocket. So my question would be, who said the public had to pay for you to do that when there are other ways to do it that uh, would be more efficient? We have, uh, because it is public's money, a way to get this funded through Congress. They have jobs in their district, and it has become uh, largely a jobs program. We built an infrastructure in Apollo that we're trying to keep because that is in particular districts. Uh, so it is one of the reasons I was focused on expanding the commercial effort is because then you are motivated in ways that allow you to make more advancements. Um, because you're not held back by the political system. Yeah, Lee, Lee, you ask what's holding us back. One thing that's holding us back is the U.S. Congress, kind of full stop. Uh, that's it, surprising. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the NASA, too, though. Na Internal Na NASA pretty much convinced Congress that we should be doing. Right. Uh, well, but the attempt that uh, Lori and her associates made in 2010 to follow a new strategy was strongly resisted by the Hill and pushed and back. And supported by parts of the agency. And supported by parts and, of the and agency. And big companies. Right. So, uh, so there, okay. there is a space industrial, congressional, yes. bureaucratic, I mean, classic triangle that still has a lot of power over the civil program, where, as you say, off on the side, people saying, hey, there's money to be made in space. Right. And that money can be made by uh, injecting innovative technology in, in navigation and earth observation and in, in, in uh, communication, uh, they're, they're, they're on an almost separate trajectory. Uh, so the world we live in, from you know, a, you're, a, you're being yeah. watched 24 seven tracked, right. it's all on your smartphone, there's a GPS receiver in your smartphone. Uh, that, that's, that's, I mean, space is only a place to do a variety of things to start out with. Well, and it's so ironic because, of course, Eisenhower, who warned us of the uh, industrial uh, triangle and that we have um, been held back by it. In addition, NASA was the very symbol of uh, capitalist ideals as we went to the moon and beat the Russians. And now what we're uh, working with is more of a socialist uh, part of a plan for right. space exploration, which is just an anathema to what this country uh, should be doing. So Charles. building off what Lori just said, you, we have a, a, a clear, stark choice that most people don't understand, and, but it's, it's really stark. You can either control where the jobs are, okay, and make sure they're in your district, which <coughs> many politicians are in control of the purse strings of NASA, you know, do or you can let go of control. There's gonna be the same amount of jobs, but there's gonna be a lot more dynamic innovation, and we're gonna achieve our goals in space, our national goals of putting humans into the solar system. And the first one, we're just not gonna get there because the only way to do it by w controlling where the jobs are, you need to have five to $10 billion more a year for NASA's budget. And they tried that three times, trying to get that huge NASA budget increase, and it isn't gonna happen. And so three times in a row we failed, and so there's still people grasping on that they can have that central plan control approach, controlling all, all the strings. Well, is that, a, is that simply a communications problem, getting the public to, to be aware of that so that if the members of Congress are holding it back, or is it... I, I think we should just numbers. use the systems we use for every other aspect of uh, society 
which is allow the private sector, don't compete with them, uh, incentivize them by driving technologies that will be uh, necessary for us as we explore further. We had, a, this is not a new concept, in the late 80s when I was at the National Space Society, a board meeting uh, where a NASA rep was talking about what they're doing and the space shuttle and its importance, and she was using the analogy of the canals versus when the railway came. And I'll never forget, Marvin Minsky, who was on our board, said, yes, this is a very important analogy, and obviously, if you allowed the railroads to go, we would get to the West Coast faster than if you build canals, but you, my dear, are supporting the canals. Uh, NASA sees themselves as being uh, cutting edge when it's not really uh, where it is these days. And for a long time, we didn't have outside investors willing to take on the human exploration part. NASA has done a terrific job with uh, utilizing commercial and the military, utilizing commercial resources, could always do more. But things like comms, right. uh, positioning, and uh, a lot of data that comes for Earth Sciences now being more and more delivered by the private sector. Companies like Planet Labs were able to do this for pennies on a dollar of what Landsat, which NASA is still trying to uh, get a billion to two billion dollars a year to fund uh, for a lot less resolution of data. Just it, it's, it will come, it's come in other areas, and human space flight with the advent of the commercial crew program is, uh, I think, next. Uh, that, what's interesting to me in, within especially the private investment uh, space is obviously a lot of the companies you mentioned are run by just very wealthy people who have just might have an interest in it. But are there companies that are doing, and, and I guess what are the, their goals that are doing things commercially that were, it's actually, a, it's just going to be a good company well, versus, there, versus just. Boeing. There, there is, but there's, right. yeah, so, there's there, companies yeah. putting strategic investments in. There's the philanthropic capitalists of the people who've made a lot of money elsewhere and want to put it in space to make a difference and make a little money. But there's also venture capital funds. Lori mentioned Planet Labs. They've raised on the order of about $180 million from venture capitalists. There's a bunch of innovation going on in private investors looking at this sector as a new place to invest and make money. Yeah. Um, Fair Nevada is another one. People may know Planet Lab. It's basically three scruffy guys from Silicon Valley. Uh, it's gotten bigger, <laughs> right. Uh, but that's how it started. And they were able to go out and, because they had a good idea right. and raise the money. Um, so, there's a lot, there's many dozens of companies out just below the radar raising real money, building real hardware, flying real hardware. And that's the future. That's, that's actually fundamentally American. We're the, the land of free enterprise. We can open space using a partnership between the best of government and the best of private industry. And that study I mentioned. We can put a permanent base on the moon to industrialize, to mine the moon for propellant to open up the solar system. And we can do it within NASA's existing budget. But it would just require we change how we do space. And we, NASA's already proved we can do this. We've done it with space station cargo delivery. And we're doing it with crew transportation to space station. And that is, there's bipartisan agreement on this. This is a program that was created, the Commercial Crew Cargo Program was created in the Bush 43 administration, and it was doubled down by President Obama. So there, and actually, it was, uh, most people forget, Newt Gingrich publicly praised President Obama when he did that. So there is bipartisan agreement on it, and it's really the, con it's not bipartisan, it's a, it's a uh, battle between the dynamicist versus the, the status quo. It's parochial, not partisan, I right. like to say. And it isn't an either or with government and commercial. They work together. They have, private sector has built everything that NASA has developed. They really don't build a lot of their own. But just looking to play a role that is more of uh, an incentive for our industry to recognize we are them, we, we are together. It's not either or. It was difficult at the time that uh, Elon announced he's building a larger rocket and the NASA people would say, come on, Lori, you've got to talk to Elon because we got out of the low Earth orbit rocket. We're giving him that, but we, you got to get him out of the long-term deep space because that's ours. I said, ah, fundamentally, you just don't understand the uh, uh, paradigm that is we're not in a race in a lane in a swimming pool that everybody's racing against each other with our own 
industry. Uh, we're in a, maybe a cycling race where we should be riding point in the government with others drafting behind us. And if someone comes alongside because they can pass us because they found a better way, we don't get out our tire pump and stick them in the spokes. Y you know, we, we uh, take the next hill that will help them go even farther. Yeah. Let me defend NASA a little bit in a couple of dimensions. First of all, when you're talking about humans going into space with government sponsorship, it has to be conservative. You can't risk human yes, life. That's another great point. Uh, that, I mean, you know, Virgin Galactic can have a problem, as they did on Spaceship uh, Two, uh, with a design flaw, uh, and they keep going. If there were another shuttle like accident in human spaceflight, very. So that's another thing that holds us back. And now I am in the aviation world working with the pilots. And you look at how the development of aviation occurred. And you had early on the government sponsored uh, project mail, yeah. being, well, the first project being for flight of Langley. They were government backed. And he drilled it into the Potomac. Yeah. The Wright brothers, no government money, in fact, couldn't convince the government to buy even after they flew their airplanes until they went to France. Uh, and finally, that was adopted. So the innovations were made by the private sector and accidents happened often. And people got back up and got on the planes. Had those been government developed, that might have been That might have been a different uh, outcome. Different. Right. But building on that, after the Wright brothers, we had this great partnership with the NACA, the predecessor of NASA, yes. and private industry. And lots of people died. And we have the, the world's leading aviation industry, in part because we figured out how to mix the brilliant genius of American entrepreneurs like Bill Boeing and Glenn Martin with the leadership and the research and the advanced technologies that NACA developed and, and melded together. That we had lost world leadership and we surpassed and regained real leadership because of that partnership. And that's what we can do in human spaceflight. And you know, people are still at risk in aviation or in space. There's a way of doing this. Well, yeah, you Boeing say, took a big say, risk on the jet, right. uh, but it was theirs, it wasn't yeah. the government's. And it you, made you say partnership, that will require NASA. I mean, I get asked, yes. do we need NASA? Absolutely. Uh, and, and the answer is, uh, we need a NASA, we need a government organization to take the risks that the private sector yes. won't take. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of good people just, and capabilities. And let's just throwing. say there's another geopolitical purpose akin to Apollo that the nation's leadership, the elected leadership decides to do that is should be government led. Of course, we they should do it in partnership in the most efficient way with the private sector they can, but they would lead for this country that effort, whether that is a lunar return, mission to Mars, current plans for an asteroid, that is entirely appropriate. But we don't just do it to do it, or because someone grew up wanting to do it. Yeah. We do it for a geopolitical right. purpose. Well, in that sense, how is, how is the space program, how is it or can it be linked to foreign policy? I mean, should, should we be doing it alone? Should we, all these efforts be joint? Well, first of all, we can't do it alone. And, and there is capability all over the world. I mean, uh, India has sent a mission to Mars. The United Arab Emirates are getting ready to do the same and forming a space agency. Uh, uh, China's become the third country to be able to, to send people in space, they should be involved in the space station at some point along, well, we, not very distant from we now. We could be a carrot or a stick, and we've been a carrot uh, on the space station. We have brought the Russians in. It was at NASA at that time. In the Clinton era, we probably wouldn't have had the space station continue without restructuring it to include the Russians. We have, we have been the stick with Apollo, with Apollo Soyuz. We were planning uh, to do more joint missions, and when they went into Afghanistan, we stopped doing that. So with China right now, the Hill has said we cannot uh, cooperate, coordinate our space activities with them. So we are a public policy tool and a negative. But I think most people in space would like it to, again, be a carrot and hold it out there as a way we could work together peacefully. Well, because, I mean, in Apollo, we led through achievement, saying, I mean, it was sending a message for US power right. and US leadership. In today's world, you lead through partnerships. You are the leading partner. And I you know, I'm, uh, was a supporter of President Obama, both in 08 and 12. I'm disappointed that he has not gone out as President Reagan did in 1984, and at the presidential level, say, let's work together 
for space exploration. I think that's, you know, starting from the top down, there's a lot of bottoms up conversations about cooperation, what it would take, but we need top down leadership right. uh, in order to make that happen. Well, well, let me, let me, and to support that, sorry, you really have to have a capability. So the president can say, hey, I have this particular geopolitical uh, need. And NASA would say, well, we could get there, and I believe it has to be within 10 years for a cost somewhat less than 5% of the federal budget. And you, you uh, as an agency or a space community, could offer to be helpful. At this point, we have not gotten there. I, I think there's a great op geopolitical opportunity for returning to the moon. Right now, um, NASA's focused on Mars to the exclusion of the moon, but all our international partners want to go to the moon. Uh, we've been to the moon, but uh, Japan has not, Europe has not, um, the Canadians have not, and they all want to go to the moon. The director of ESA wants to go to the moon, the, the, the head of uh, the Canadian Space Agency has made remarks they want to go to the moon, Japan would prefer to go to the moon, and they were quietly telling us they would like to go back to the moon with America as a partner, and we've been politely telling them that we're not going to do that. Not um, exactly true. We have. We, I, have, we I, have said we, we're not going to We leave. could have a strategy to go back to the moon today that was fits within our budget yeah, and establish uh, a permanent base there. And that would be, I think, the, 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 uh, the ultimate shining city on the hill and could you know, really achieve some national geopolitical objectives. Um, it would be a send a great message around the world. So, so just to follow up, and we'll get to uh, the audience in a second, what is keeping these countries from going by themselves right now? So of all, uh, you know, people complain that NASA doesn't have a large enough budget, but if you total up every other nation's space budget on the planet, they equal about three quarters of NASA. So uh, we are in the lead. We have a good uh, head start, and I believe if we structured, as I said, just a little bit, we would be running even faster cooperating with other countries when we had our initial rollout of our 2011 plan and budget. I went overseas to sell it, and they were all very interested in the new strategy, and it would have likely led to Mars only through the moon. But when we had this political um, reaction to other programs being cut, the demand was for a destination. Within the budget, we did not have a, uh, enough for a lander for the moon, so the president picks an asteroid. We certainly didn't have enough to go to Mars. So no. it was just a budget reality, not a we'll never go to the moon uh, again um, policy, but it has ended up, I think, because the leadership at NASA currently is more interested in, in Mars, and they want to build this big rocket, and the justification has to be something. Yeah. I mean, if you listen to uh, uh, Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, the language has changed over the past couple of years to saying, we're ready to help people go back to the, mar to, to the moon. We are going to build the big rocket. We're just not going to have the money to build the lander. But if somebody else builds the lander, we'd be happy to be a partner in return to the moon. Uh, and I frankly, personal view, I think that that would be the uh, smart way to proceed. And so why aren't they just like why we aren't? What is the purpose? Uh, what is going to cause your nation's citizens to say, yeah, I want to put my money into this so we can be the you know, uh, seventh mission to the moon and send someone? You, you need to, I, I think, address that. Most other space programs, even though they're a lot smaller than us to begin with, have even a smaller portion of them for human spaceflight. They're very focused on earth sciences right. and those benefits yeah. that return to society Direct more visibly. Direct applications to their citizens. Yes. Right. yes. Yeah. All right, so with that, we invite audience members to join in the discussion. So please wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. Uh, please stand, state your name and affiliation, and uh, try to keep questions and comments concise to allow as many members as possible to speak. Yes, sir. Uh, Rob Cortell with Intellix, and we have nothing to do with space, but um, I have a geopolitical question. Um, I grew up just outside Cape Canaveral. My father started there in 1957, spent 35 years designing the VAB, 
Um, so, so I grew up on all this, and I think all this new stuff's incredibly exciting, the private sector stuff. The geopolitical, you mentioned the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Canadians, and the rest. What about the Chinese? You know, two-thirds of the planet has been born since we went to the moon. And the remainder, half of them don't believe we really went. So when the Chinese go, if they will, and I'm asking for an assessment, everybody's going to think they were first. So talk about the Chinese and those guys. I believe that we will go back before the Chinese go, personally, or we'll go with them. I think we have the capability well beyond the Chinese. They have basically purchased their space program from Russia. Uh, they aren't innovating like we are in this country yet, but they will get there. And their interest in these other nations uh, in going to the moon will likely inspire us to go back. And uh, I think we will do it in a way that hopefully is sustainable and potentially cooperative, depending on where this nation's relationship goes with China. You know, I mean, the Chinese in human spaceflight have done exactly what they've said they were going to do in 1992. They set out a program. They've executed that program. They've said they're going to build a medium-sized space station in the early 2020s. Every reason to think that's what they're going to do. They have not yet said they intend to send people to the moon. It's the I hate to use the word logical next step that has a, a history to it. But it, and any country that sends people into space eventually is going to want them to go somewhere. Uh, and the moon is just an offshore island. So, I mean, it's just logic. That but they're about where we were in the Gemini program. So, That's right. I mean, you <laughs> got, you got, they're back in the 60s. You have two geopolitical choices here, and, and I think uh, there's not been d discussion about that, where you could return to the moon. One would be a return to the moon with your exist, most of the existing partners of the ISS basically to send something consistent with our values that we're going to be founded on democracies that also use free enterprise. And you can do the moon in that way. That was the result of the study. You could do that. That's a geopolitical choice to send the message that we're going to be the future of humanity is free enterprise and free democracy. Another one, which is also a geopolitical choice, is to go back and bring China and Russia into the partnership as well. You start with the president and the Congress, which geopolitical choice do they want to make? And uh, I think it's actually easier for a Republican to make the latter choice. It was Nixon who went to China, right? It was Nixon who did Apollo Soyuz. I think it would have been more difficult for this president to do something like Apollo Soyuz or, or do something with, with the Chinese you know, and our crew system docking in space. But if it's a Republican, it makes it a little easier. So you start with the geopolitical choice. Is that choice. a campaign speech for a Republican president? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Got to fill our potholes first. <laughs> So I know it was not a campaign. So it's, it's, I'm just saying it'd probably be easier for the Republican to partner with the Chinese, you know, but doesn't mean they would want to. Okay, depends on who you pick. Yeah. Right? So those are the two choices. Pick your geopolitical choice, and then you can have a program to support it. Yes, sir. David Aaron, uh, Rand Corporation. Um, I, I have two questions, really. One is a, just a factual question. What is the comparative size of the expenditures of NASA and our private sector? Do they compare? Are they just be interested in getting a in sense? In space? Huh? In space? Yes. You have to put a discount on that because there's one big private application of space that makes lots of money and therefore spends a lot of money to make it, which is communication satellites. And that's, that's a big slice of spending which really isn't counted as space, uh, even though the, the relays, the, uh, the satellites are in space. If you take that away, what would be the guess of private sector space spending? And defining what you mean by private there, you know, so it excludes selling to government, uh, which is mainly where SpaceX is going, for example. I would say order of what, three or four billion a year, maybe? So that's compared to it depends, it depends how you account for it. There's yeah. a, the, the total global, if you add what John just suggested excluding, the Space Foundation does an annual report, it approaches $200 billion a year of total revenue for all the different parts of the different commercial space program. 
And so the uh, commercial part, if you count everything, is larger than the government. But if you don't count things like telecom, like DirecTV, which is the biggest you know, application, which is tens of billions of dollars of revenue that's going into that, then it's a much different answer. And that yeah. sort of makes the point. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of billions of dollars that we get. It's an export industry. This is something that this nation does well, and we're in the lead in the private sector as well as government. Yeah. And yeah. the idea would be that the private sector does it for less. Right. So even if it's in principle, they're doing the exact same principle. thing. The idea would be that they're they're yeah. going to spend less. My second question is: I've been struck by all this discussion of geopolitical objectives for the space program. What about scientific objectives? I haven't heard a word about that as being something that was actually important and, in fact, motivates. I think a lot of people out of school anyway to go into the the space program. Uh, and I, I and since that it's not a money maker necessarily. How can you ask the private sector, which has to look at the bottom line at some point, even in the future, to do the kinds of things that uh, a nonprofit organization like NASA uh, can devote its efforts to? So we all talked about how the focus of this discussion on the human spaceflight program, that NASA does a lot of really valuable things, other things, and science is one of those. The science programs at NASA, Earth science, uh, aeronautics, space science, uh, make up half of their budget. So that's a fabulous thing. Human spaceflight has never been about science. I know we like to use it every now and then, and the very last astronaut we sent to the moon was, in fact, a geologist. But uh, you don't spend those amounts of public sector money for science. I think NSF's budget in its entirety is less than NASA's, the whole NASA National Science Foundation. So much, much just less than the, the total area, NASA. So just the area of science that you can study in space would be a fraction of that if you didn't have this glory and uh, attached to it. I mean, we're spending $6 billion a year on robotic space science. If you took that out from under the cover of the broader human spaceflight public interest, whether you would get $6 billion a year on scientific payoff compared to other areas of science is arguable. And I would argue NASA could do it in a way that gets a lot more science for the dollar by partnering with the private sector. A lot of the data we have, the capability of getting from commercial satellites, could uh, provide uh, scientific learning for people. And we're starting to do more and more of that. Another thing, it's not either or with science or commerce. Uh, you know, lower costs, routine, reliable commercial services, you enable a lot of good science at much lower cost. So if you had a a return to the moon that was enabled by commercial partnerships, you're going to do a whole bunch of science on the moon. NASA could send astronauts to the moon, like it sends to the space station, on commercial rockets at much lower cost. And then they could do a ton of science at the moon. Um, you could put a radio telescope on the far side of the moon. A lot of people would like to do it. There's, there's a lot to do. So it's, there is a win-win there where you can do both. And the Webb Telescope alone is a $9 billion science mission that NASA intends to launch in a couple of years. They do a lot of science. Yeah. I saw Webb this week. I was out at Goddard Space Flight Center. It's going to be, what, 18 mirrors and a, a very elaborate uh, structure where the first mirror is going to be put in next week. It's sort of, and, and it's your typical government program. I would go see the Webb a lot in its yeah. development, and they would show you a map with where will we mine uh, for this material here, and then ship it here, and then polish it there, and then they hand it. And this were all congressional districts. And they considered it a feature, not a bug. And I'm like, no wonder it cost $9 billion. Yeah. Do you think if we had done that in a different way, we could have it already? Which was $8 billion more than projected at the start. <laughs> not to mention that took so long that a lot of the science that we're getting now from Kepler, you would do things differently. So it's one of these that's going to pass you along the way if you set your architecture and your technology at a point in time for a 20-year program. That's my other problem with setting the architecture now for Mars. My criticisms are quite different than those who say, oh, we don't have a real program. Of course we don't. It's, it's, it's 20 years we should. away. <laughs> yes, sir. I will jump in the back there. And then, yeah. uh, Benny Garrett, uh, consultant in uh, Singularity University. I'm very interested in all you've been saying, and one of the things you I think I'd love to see you elaborate on is sort of the disruptive technologies coming from the private sector. And you've mentioned CubeSats, which 
there's no money in them for Boeing and Lockheed compared to billion dollar satellites, right? And it's totally disruptive. They can do so many new th things that now much more cheaply and, uh, and a lot more of it. I've also worked with the maiden space people who put the first 3D printer on the space station, as you well know. What's interesting there is why wasn't that done by Lockheed? Because there's no money in it. I mean, it, and they did it for two, three million dollars. It's three guys came out of Singularity in 2010, created a little company with the help of NASA, Pete Warden and those guys, figured out how to do a zero G printer, put it on the station. But the whole point was their idea is you can't really go into space seriously if you can't make stuff in space. You have to haul it all out of the gravity well of Earth, already made and be able to withstand nine Gs of gravity. If you can make it in space, it can be lighter, faster, better, et cetera. So they built a, a printer that can print in a vacuum so you could extrude huge structures. And if you want to go to Mars and the moon, you could send robotic printers to build the structures before you ever get there. I mean, it's a whole different way of doing things. It seems a bit of a threat to the traditional space mafia, as somebody once called it in the uh, Pentagon to me. And I wonder what you think, because I think that's a lot of what's happening is a new way of doing things and get, getting things done that might not have been possible in the past and greatly lower the cost if you can make stuff in space instead of haul it out. And that's a good, how much, how much control do the bigger companies that are in the private sector, the Lockheed's and Boeing's and others, are how much are they controlling that side of things compared to the small startups? That almost, almost entirely. Uh, that is the military industrial complex, and uh, you would see some of those briefings. They're so exciting. I even uh, an astronaut briefed on using lunar material with robotics that could generate more robots uh, to build. Uh, whatever, uh, whether it be the telescopes or what we wanted in space, you have in space refueling that would radically change the architecture that you'd use. And these are not unobtainium. Uh, these are things that you could actually uh, invest in and do. And I just, it's not different than other sectors. IBM did not innovate first, uh, but they're there now and they're still around and they're making more money. So I absolutely believe the major companies will do this, uh, and it's going to take Grudgingly. some of the smallers yeah. to, but to leave. But that's, by the way, what is going to keep them sharp and competitive internationally. We, we aren't helping Lockheed and Boeing by just giving them a cost-plus contract to do something that was invented 70 years ago. We are not helping U.S. competitiveness. We, we are holding them back. And so to uh, really drive that, we've got just a blessing of uh, industrialists of the day who are investing in this, and that is causing everybody to be sharper. An, an example of this is Jeff Bezos. He's one of the great disruptors of our time, and he went out and built an engine for his company, Blue Origin. He's got a secretive rocket company, and he went to a company, one of the big considered old space companies, United Launch Alliance, which was in trouble from Elon, which being disrupted, and he brought his engine in that was far ahead in development, and United Launch Alliance got a new CEO who said, I'm going to use that engine to build a new launch vehicle. Shifted the whole culture of the company in the last 24 months. So that's where a big, previously old school company is adjusting. But at the same time, it's really interesting, Aerojet, which had refused to spend $500 million to invest in the next rocket engine because they were waiting for the U.S. government to pay for the development, um, went and spent the $500 billion buying another company called Pratt & Whitney. If they had spent it on the engine, then ULA would probably be using their engine today. So they were using old style tactics and Aerojet is in serious threat of maybe going out of business because th their customer left them and just recently announced they're not going to buy solid rocket motors from them either. So there is a lot of disruption going on in the space industry today in a variety of different sectors. And as with all of uh, evolution, the earlier adopters uh, get the best chance of succeeding. So <laughs> I love to see Boeing and our commercial crew because they, they know how to do it with airplanes. They take risks with public transportation every day, and uh, they, they are doing a great job. Lady in the back, and we'll move forward. Leonore Tamara with House Armed Services Committee. Oh, Leonore Tamara with House Armed Services Committee. So piggybacking on this um, fascinating discussion about um, the revolution in the private sector with the advent of um, Black Sky, Plant Labs, wh where, do you th where do you see the role for government then? Is it just to stand aside and reap the benefits? Um, 
or are there, is there something that government can do to further facilitate um, uh, the success of these companies? Is it more launch opportunities? Um, what are the challenges and should government help or stand aside? Let, let, let me stick in just a point. Uh, she's coming from House Armed Services Committee. We haven't talked at all about how innovative or non-innovative the national security space sector is. I mean, there's as much money there uh, as there is in NASA of government money. Is that old space? Is there innovation there? Yeah, they're going through the same yeah. challenges. They are benefiting from the lower launch class, which is fabulous because that's our nation's budget and the safety and security of our men and women overseas. Uh, they are buying commercial data at like 70% of their comms are bought commercially now. I was trying to get NASA to do that, but we're more special. And the, uh, so I see a classic role like the NACA was uh, for space and aeronautics development now for space. Of course there's a role. There's the science role. Uh, and there's that cutting edge technology and buying down the risks. And there's even uh, markets. The Airmail Act that allowed uh, airlines to get their real start are things we could be doing. We can pay to fly our astronauts on vehicles that are taking other people as well, uh, and our stuff, hosted payloads. Uh, we have a tremendous amount that NASA could be doing, and I think that's some of the fear. Fear at NASA, you grew up and you love this and you don't want it to go away. It doesn't go away, and you embrace uh, all of the things that they will enable. They come more enabling than just doing it themselves. Yeah, NASA's greatest days are ahead of it. Um, everybody is looking in the mirror, pining for Apollo. I, I fundamentally believe that NASA's greatest achievements are in front of us. They, they are, in my opinion, the long-term planning committee for the human race. And they need to do it in partnership with every part of America and our international partners. But we don't have, private industry is very short-term thinking, five-year time horizons. We need somebody who's thinking long-term and making long-term investments in the technologies and capabilities and the science. And that is a good fit with the driving innovation and, and push that you get from private industry. You, we need to figure out how to make them work together. And that's when we achieve greatness for America in general, but the human race more broadly. Robert. Uh, I'm Bob Bastani from the National Defense University. So I'm wondering if you could sort of distill all of this and you know, pretend you're king for however period of time you want to be. Where, where's the ideal point? How would you restructure things so that you know, we, we we have an ideal point in the future. How would you structure that? Oh, in what universe? <laughs> <laughs> this current one. I mean, when we're, we're talking about space, any well, universe. Well, I know, but uh, <laughs> right, it, it, we're talking about public money right. allocated through a political system, and that puts constraints on your freedom to innovate. Uh, if you take away those constraints yes. and say, in an, an ideal world, we would have a coherent national strategy that uh, relates to national security space, uh, government space, commercial space, allocates roles, responsibilities, uh, creates synergies. Uh, here we have a bunch of separate places with no cent central coordination and embedded in a political system that makes change very hard. Uh, Lori will... How do I want to say this? We used to have central authorities in the White House. We used to have a thing called a Space Council that was set up to do that kind of planning. The resistance to, to doing it was too strong, so it didn't really work. But some central, I mean, at this point, in the White House structure, there are about three people that care about space. And they fight fires every hour. They don't do long-term strategic planning. And that's not the way to get a coherent policy. I think that's a piece of it, but for uh, what NASA would actually be doing, you don't have to look much farther than a budget request in 2011 that uh, really bought down some of uh, the long-term needs that any exploration program would have. A cheaper engine, a 
that you could operate for much less costs across government. The military would love to have this as well. Looking at what we call 21st century infrastructure, which meant tearing down old expensive buildings and making sure that NASA was using facilities that they needed, not finding programs to fit large expensive facilities. And doing flagship missions that are unique in that they drive technology, it's okay if they fail, you do things like use solar electric propulsion, optical communications, which then can have tremendous benefits for the nation and the world and our own industry. Uh, being able to reestablish NASA as a lead, I think internationally, reaching out to cooperate with others, deciding on a human exploration strategy that will include more people than just us, and finding the unique ways to go um, that will leave behind societal benefits. I, I think it is absolutely what we will be doing over time. It's just we're at the struggle between fo folks who, uh, of course, always want to and fight harder to keep something uh, than anybody knew to get it because we don't know who's going to win in the new day. Uh, there are two gentlemen in the back that I think had a question that we can do just two questions in a row and then. Paul Steimers with K&L Gates and Leonor, thank you. The, 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 the question of what government can do, I think, is, is, has been answered over the last couple of weeks uh, with a, a lot of work leading up to it. Congress just passed the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, uh, which, among other things, helps create uh, and, and extend and expand a regulatory regime that is designed to uh, help make sure that the commercial space industry can launch uh, safely, effectively, routinely, quickly. Uh, and creating that kind of a regime is, is vitally important, and that, that was a big step forward. That's going to go to the president later this week. Uh, and I think part of that uh, includes uh, uh, kind of a sweeping provision that recognizes property rights uh, in space. If you go to uh, an asteroid or another uh, location in space and obtain resources from, from there, uh, according to this act, the U.S. government says that's yours. That is a, an element of certainty that can unlock investment and, and can provide the kind of, of opportunity that, that develops these capabilities without, without relying on taxpayer money. Lori, thank you for all of the scars that you've endured throughout this process. Uh, and, and, and the rest of you on the panel, it's been, it's been quite a journey to get to where we are, and I agree that the, 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 the future is, is looking very bright for the partnership between the commercial industry and, and NASA. Well, it has been a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Space property rights is on my list of things like the Homestead Act that the government did back to inspire and incentivize innovation that they can do hard, hard work to get that done. But um, those are exactly the kinds of things government can do. But of course, NASA wants to actually uh, be, be more of a part of it. And there are plenty of, of those things as well. And driving down those risks that in, in space, Propellant transfer, I just can't believe you haven't talked about this. was Charles' thing. He really, really uh, ran it hard while he was at NASA, and it would be a game changer for uh, uh, space, space exploration, driving down the cost and so forth. But the forces that want to launch big rockets don't yeah. want to do it. Propellant transfer would be a revolutionary technology. It uh, um, would take all our existing, rather building a new rocket, we can achieve most of our goals in space using existing launch vehicles from United Launch Alliance, from SpaceX. And what you need to do is uh, propellant storage and transfer. And what most people don't realize is 80% of the mass that you need to launch off the planet to go to the moon or go to Mars is propellant. And if you can launch it uh, up in smaller can, uh, parts on smaller rockets and just transfer the propellant, kind of like we do with transporting uh, gasoline to gas stations. We don't take some huge monster truck to the gas station and do it all in, in one you know, mission. We, you, you have multiple missions and you transfer the propellant. If we do the same thing in space, it has a dramatic reduction in the cost of getting into space. And that was a core assumption in uh, the study I reported that I, we just completed for NASA. And it saves, it re reduces the cost of returning to the moon by about an order of magnitude. So there's huge benefits there. Let, let me react to the comment about property rights, because it's a good council on foreign relations type question. The US, through its legislation, has unilaterally uh, declared property rights in space. Uh, and there's no UN 
treaty or any other international agreement on property rights. It's a, a unilateral action. Does that mean we're going to lead to form an international consensus uh, by action? Or is it that we're being kind of a rogue uh, in, in doing that? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it, it, it's an interesting activity. The, the, the bill that Paul was talking about is actually a very smartly formed bill. And the, I uh, commend the author of, of the original bill. Um, it was, it, we were going to recognize the resources you mine that are yours, consistent with international law. So it's very modeled after the existing Outer Space Treaty, existing international treaties, um, where you get a slot in geosynchronous. We recognize your right to broadcast from there without interference. And so what we're based, this bill basically says is we're going to recognize your right to use those resources and mine resources without interference and, uh, and, and be, to have a productive activity, and, you know, so to have a contract to sell them. And it's also based on international common law where uh, precedents have been set where the United States brought rocks back to the moon, the Russians did the same, we traded them. So we're allowing commercial companies to do quite something similar to those other precedents. All right, so we have time for probably one more question uh, before we take it, and it'll be you in a second. But uh, just remind everyone uh, that, all, and that this meeting has been on the record. Uh, so everything said here will, can be hold, held against you in a court of law. <laughs> if anybody's <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. David Wertheim with Farm Policy Magazine. I can't resist asking this question. What changes in everything you've been discussing if uh, we discover extraterrestrial life? In particular, I'm thinking of a you know, relatively simple life form. How does that change, <clears throat> in particular, the political calculus? How does it remove some of the political constraints that you've been talking about? Thanks. So extraterrestrial, non-sentient life, we've sort of run the, run the experiment. I mean, I think most scientists uh, who have, have studied it believe there uh, was, at least in the past, life on Mars. And it hasn't changed much. Uh, I was at NASA in the 90s when we thought we had found the Allen Hills fossil with life in it. And I remember thinking it would change everything. And it was a headline for two days. And this is long before the scientific process worked through where there was a lot of debate and determined not uh, likely that it was fossilized life form. But we ran the experiment politically and publicly, and it didn't change a lot. I think intelligent life is an entirely different uh, construct. I have thought two major disruptors externally, either finding intelligent life or uh, an incoming asteroid with a likelihood to hit us is what would incentivize the world to motivate to um, expand our efforts in either of those regards. But I, I don't think that uh, biological life does. No. If anything, it might keep you from going because there's a lot of people who feel that should be allowed to develop on its own and we would contaminate it. Yeah, there, there's a, quite a few people that think that if humans, if we discover microbes on Mars, there will be a lot of resistance to allowing humans to go to Mars um, and uh, make it a lot more difficult. And if you discover evidence of intelligent life in an exoplanet yeah, light Miami. years away, philosophically, it's a profound discovery, but you can't do much about it, at least until we get warp drive or something similar. And we're not quite there yet. The most immediate political thing I'll probably break out is the fight over do you send that ex intelligent extraterrestrial life as signal? And We've been sending wanted, signals for... But do you intentionally say send them a, a very high power laser beam with communications to make it highly likely that they'll see us? And there's, uh, you could be inviting them to come to our solar system. Maybe they're more advanced than us. And there's plenty of science fiction on potential consequences. Well, but the nearest star is an eight-year round trip right. at the speed of light. Right. So uh, it's, it's, it's good to we think can't about. We can go, yeah. You know, we're not That's going. a few disruptions yeah. away. But it's a fascinating uh, un topic. Un unless you talk about singularity, unless we get to the singularity. Right, right, right. Uh, well, on that note, uh, you'll all go see a big movie coming out. I'm sure it's called Star Wars. Uh, let's talk about that. But I want to thank uh, Lori, John, and Charles for, for joining us. I think it was a really great discussion. And uh, thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you. Thank you.